So let's start off by reminding ourselves exactly what the argument from lost disagreement was. So remember, this was an objection to contextualism. And the basic objection was that contextualism can't make sense of cases where non-skeptics seem to be disagreeing with skeptics. So this is the kind of dialogue we've seen all the time in this class. We imagine some person claiming they have knowledge of an ordinary proposition. So Alice says something like, I know my car is parked outside. And Billy, the non-skeptic, says, no, you don't know that. You can't know that because maybe you're a brain in a vat. And in such case, of course your car wouldn't be outside. So since you can't rule that out, you don't know. So remember that contextualism said that what proposition exactly you assert about knowledge depends on the context you're in and the standards for knowledge you have in that context. So if a non-skeptic like Alice says that she knows her car is parked outside, she expresses and asserts the proposition that she knows by ordinary standards or low standards, something along those lines. On the other hand, according to the contextualist, somebody like Billy, who says that Alice doesn't know her car is outside, is saying that Alice doesn't know according to high standards or according to skeptical standards that her car is outside. That's just the contextualist view about what these two people are asserting. And of course, when you put it that way, it starts to become puzzling why there's any disagreement going on. So we just saw a case where it's clear, it seems clear that there is disagreement going on. At the very least, Alice and Billy take themselves to be in a disagreement. But it's not clear why this would be the case for contextualists. Because on the contextualist view, they're asserting propositions that are completely consistent with each other. The proposition that Alice is asserting is very different from the one that Billy is denying. Alice is asserting that she knows by low standards. Billy is denying that she knows by high standards. But of course, it can, you can fail to know by high standards even when you know by low standards. So why is there any disagreement? You might think just looking at other cases that the contextualists should predict that they're talking past each other. So we already saw last week the example of maybe where Alice says, I'm hungry, and Billy says, no, I'm not hungry. We said that that case doesn't really seem to involve a disagreement. Billy just sort of sounds confused about what Alice was saying. And it looks like contextualism gives a very good explanation of this. The reason why they're talking past each other is because Alice is saying something about Alice. Billy is saying something about Billy. And these two things are just completely compatible with each other. But of course, if that's what's happening in the hungry case, then why isn't the same thing happening in the knowledge case? If the contextualist says that Alice and Billy are talking past each other in the hungry case, shouldn't they also be committed to saying that they're talking past each other in the skeptical case? Of course, this is exactly what is not happening. So this is why this seems like a big challenge to contextualism. This is a good point to step back and notice that there's a crucial premise in this argument one that we haven't really been careful about formulating to this point, because our interest has just been to get the basic um, argument going. But the thing that we've been relying on is basically a view about when disagreements happen. And one thing we've taken in putting the argument this way to be an, at least a necessary condition for a disagreement is that there's one proposition that one party is asserting and the other party is denying the very same proposition. I'll take denying to just mean asserting the negation of. So if you assert P, then I'm denying that P just in case I assert not P. So this is our premise about disagreement that has been kind of in the background, that they have to be asserting and denying the same proposition in order to count as disagreeing. And this premise isn't entirely implausible. In fact, it looks extremely reasonable when you look at the hungry case. I mean, the reason why when Alice says I'm hungry and Billy says I'm not hungry, there's no disagreement, is because while one is saying the negation of the other sentence, Billy is not denying the proposition that Alice expressed. Alice expressed the proposition that Alice is hungry. Billy is not denying that. He's, he is asserting the proposition that Billy is not hungry. And of course, that's not the negation of the proposition that Alice is hungry. So this premise, which we'll call strong disagreement, is not like, it, it's not like, this is a necessarily a sneaky move. It looks like a very plausible premise. All that being said though, one of the things we're going to do today is put a little bit more scrutiny on this premise and see whether it really holds up in the end. So we've recapped the argument from disagreement and we've drawn out the principle of strong disagreement. Before we go on though, it's worth emphasizing how the relativist takes themselves 
to explain what's going on here. Because remember, if the relativist is basing their argument on this strong disagreement principle, then of course their favorite explanation had better respect it in explaining what's going on with disagreement. So it's worth taking a little bit of time to say why exactly you might think the relativist is explaining this in their case. So we said a lot of things about relativism last time. So there were a few crucial ideas. One crucial idea was that truth is relative not just to a context, but to a context of assessment. Another crucial idea was that a truth in a context of assessment is hooked up to, ass to assertion and disagreement in a certain way. So McFarlane thinks the rule is assert P only if it's true in your context of assessment. And the rule for disagreement is deny P only if it's false in your context of assessment. And we said how these things together can predict the pattern that we said before, why Alice should be able to assert something and Billy should be able to disagree with something. And we said a little bit about this strong disagreement principle, but it's worth spending a bit more time catching out exactly why the relativist is supposed to do better here. And the basic idea here is that just like we saw that propositions may be true or false at different times, part of the relativist view is that propositions may also be true or false at different contexts of assessment. So the very same proposition might be true in Alice, the non-skeptic's context of assessment, while it's false in Billy, the skeptic's context of assessment. So the very same proposition might be true or false in the different contexts. This might initially seem like a difficult thing to get your head around, but the analogy that is worth falling back on again and again is maybe like time. So for instance, you might think that the proposition David Boylan is eating is something that might be true or false at different times. So it was true earlier on, now it's no longer true. Its truth value varies depending on what point in time you evaluate it at. And the relativist idea is that why not just extend this idea so that propositions are true or false relative to different things, except, you know, instead of just having times, add in other things as well. So maybe have the same proposition, true or false, relative to different contexts of assessment. And the way in which it's supposed to be true or false, or the way in which its truth value differs across the different contexts of assessment, is just meant to be completely analogous to the way that that happens with times. So if you agree with this idea, or at least agree with the coherence of this idea, that propositions can vary in their truth value across times, it looks like there isn't any in principle objection to saying the same thing about contexts of assessment, saying that Again, propositions, they can change their truth value depending on what kind of thing they're evaluated at. But in addition, maybe to being sensitive to the time it's being evaluated at, some propositions also depend on the context of assessment for their truth value. So this idea that propositions vary in their truth value across contexts of assessment is really central to how the relativist is supposed to do better with respect to disagreement. Because remember, the premise of the argument is that we only have disagreements when one party is asserting a proposition that the other party is denying. And this looks like it's exactly what the relativist is now saying. Once we adopt this idea that propositions themselves, their truth is relative to context of assessment. Because on the relativist view, when Alice and Billy are having their disagreement, there is just one proposition, the proposition that Alice knows her car is parked outside, and that proposition is true at Alice's context of assessment, but false at Billy's context of assessment. And that's what allows for them to have a disagreement. And importantly, that's what allows for them to have a disagreement, even at, while at the same time, the notion of the standard that they're using is playing a crucial role in why they're allowed to assert what they do, and, well, and why the proposition is true or false. 